listening to uh, fine art logistics and hospitality, meaning hotels, hostels, and uh, and, and uh, guest houses, and so on. So uh, we employ a lot of people uh, across different continents, and uh, I myself was educated both in Hong Kong, uh, in America, Canada, and most recently I'm doing my PhD uh, at Fudan University in China. Great, thank you, Anson. Uh, and uh, this one? Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my full name is uh, Nyan Hong Kwan. I'm the CEO of a listed company uh, with 100% owned by Singapore, New Toyo Group. Uh, this is my pleasure to, to be here uh, to have short sharing uh, with uh, all of us here. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me here. Uh, my name is Mike Gill. I am representing Center for China and Globalization. Uh, CCG in short is a non-governmental think tank in Beijing and we specialize in public policy, track to diplomacy, global trade, uh, globalization and uh, development. Uh, my own background, uh, I was very much, you know, in technology, 25 years in the US, Singapore, Southeast Asia. I still remember the, the way I am uh, yesterday, I remember lots of things resonate, the good memory where I was running around in this part of our country. Very happy to be here. Great, thank you, Mike. And uh, that is
that's very clear. There are 36 agreements between China and Vietnam. So that conversation is happening and that's great. The thing that we have to think about though is when you have a policy, let's say in your corporation, when you have a policy, in order for the employees to adopt and use that policy, there has to be more communication. And so uh, I'd like to uh, move over to Mike here. What are some ways that China and Vietnam can foster a deeper mutual understanding between the two countries? Thank you. I, I, I look at this as a great question if I recall the uh, uh, head of uh, Vietnamese uh, National Assembly just visited Beijing last week. And uh, I look at the, uh, the china Vietnamese uh, the Vietnam relationship definitely, you know, have been strengthened. I know that the moderator was saying how we are able to sustain the relationship and the trust from our top leaders between the nation to the working level, that takes lots of work. I look at the uh, few things I will definitely uh, see the huge value is for the business sectors and how we can facilitate the exchange in the industry and the students, yeah, I was uh, meeting with uh, some young Vietnamese students. I was really inspired by their knowledge, their ability to adapt new uh, uh, technologies, so on and so forth. I would say if we can promote more free Asian students and uh, even the tourists with a much more relaxed visa between the nation, that definitely can help to, you know, convey the messaging of, you know, how to strengthen the relationship. Students, I, I think that's, that's really key, right? You start communication at a young age so that people can really understand each other, not just from a policy perspective, but from a human perspective. You have to kind of like the other person before you want to work with them. Uh, what about uh, adults, right? What about business people? How, how can we increase uh, the, those communications? I look at people, I look at, uh, I, if I recall one of the stories, I look at the uh, TCL, the uh, white goods manufacturer, you know, they make uh, the uh, TV and the large uh, the format uh, uh, thread uh, TV panels. I know that all these things, uh, what they can do is they have, they already invest uh, the business here, they are creating like 10,000 jobs here. Right? So I look at what the things for Vietnam business people is really caught with the Chinese people, try to take some know-how in the manufacturing area, in the supply chain area, how to, you know, uh, promote uh, the trading with the other part of the world, leveraging the manufacturing capacity in China and in Vietnam. Second, if you look at one of things also always very fascinating, if you look at every day the e-commerce development in China, I look at cross-border transactions between Vietnam and China that definitely need to be strengthened. I look at how we are able to compare the supply chain and also even the e, I would say the procurement and the transaction, the, the, the custom clearance, so all these things, if we can do, uh, get it done uh, electronically, that will help to promote the commerce between the two countries. Okay, great. So what I'm hearing is you, we need to open up access, right? So if it's student programs where you provide exchange programs, that's providing access in terms of understanding each other's cultures, and then uh, Mike also mentioned sharing knowledge and provide, promoting trade, e-commerce, uh, information. So that's enabling access uh, at the business level. Let's talk a bit, a little bit. Let's go a little bit deeper to the uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative, and then Vietnam's uh, Two Quarters and One Ring Initiative. And those are official initiatives that are um, looking to improve ties between the two countries. How, how can, how do you see that happening? I look at one of the things uh, is uh, if I really compare uh, uh, 2023 was uh, you know, before the pandemic. I look at the hamstring, the, the, the interaction has been significantly improved. I look at the if we can, you know, from both government, it's like even for this uh, crisis, 
China campus held here in Vietnam that will help increase exposure from uh, both sides in Saint Andrews. I would say just a bit more similar events to get all of business, uh, business stakeholders online to focus on the growth of the so how can these two initiatives um, specifically help with increasing these initiatives? I look at the, uh, you know, all these initiatives basically is to help uh, people from both sides to understand the potential in each country. Number two is how to leverage the talents. Right? If you look at the talents in China, technology, R&D, supply chain, all those uh, technology and know-how, how to talk with the so-called labor-intensive manufacturing work. Right? Because China is no longer, uh, you know, as a country to compete on the cost, but are more on the leading front of technology transformation. If we can combine the strength from both sides, definitely I would say we will provide a much more uh, competitive uh, offerings. Thank you, then. That's very interesting because um, overall, Mike stressed two key things access and communication. Right? And we all know those are kind of the two key foundational pieces that you need for any type of relationship, whether that's uh, person to person or country to country. So let's dive a little bit deeper because Mike ended with China is strong at manufacturing, and we've seen that. Right? China has grown through the ranks from low. Uh, low value add manufacturing to very high value add manufacturing. And we have on stage a, an expert at manufacturing, and Mr. Fu. Uh, Mike talked about giving people more access to each other. Uh, we talked about the Belt and Road and the two corners and one green initiatives and giving businesses more infrastructure to encourage trade. So I'd like to talk to you, Mr. Fu, about what you've witnessed as the central growth in the pharmaceutical exchange between Vietnam and China. How has improved infrastructure facilitated better cooperation between the two countries? Um, the one first. Um, actually, China and Vietnam have a long history of the interaction to their agenda in the land schemes and the connect land borders. And as a exchange in the field of the pharmaceutical and the health care. Uh, I think the 2022 the report says that the Vietnam's pharmaceutical industry have an annual output value of the 2.2 or 6.2 or 6.4 billion US dollars. And the pharmaceutical industry annual output value reached 7 billion US dollars which come from the growing risk, the over 10%. The value of the pharmaceuticals and new markets in order from the China was 380 million US dollars from the Guangxi uh, port. And uh, this is, uh, uh, covered the uh, 5,000 types of the, uh, medicine. And uh, because of the COVID-19, uh, uh, pandemic has led to an uh, increased demand of uh, health and disease prevention among the, the Vietnam peoples. And uh, the, the vaccine and the biological product marketing in Vietnam is still uh, on the early stage. Uh, many of the product uh, is uh, reliant on the import. Uh, therefore, this uh, big protection to produce the biological product locally and then you replace the import product with the most effective uh, local alternative. Uh, China and uh, Vietnam can uh, utilize their the respective advantage and resources in pharmaceutical field to promote the cooperation in uh, the research and the development Manufacturer productions and the supply chain logistics. Um, China has a very strong pharmaceutical industry. Uh, and we have more than 10,000 uh, pharmaceutical factories. And we have the 
China has its uh, uh, development capacity in the field uh, of uh, technical drugs, pharmaceutical uh, drugs, and the traditional uh, medicines. And the ones who finance have the unique advantage in the uh, manpower resources and the locations and the pick market. Uh, the two countries can share the resource and the technology improve the efficiency and the capacity of industrial change and uh, achieve the uh, market beneficial and unique. Uh, uh, I think uh, from the, my point, uh, I think uh, uh, we can have the competition model like the Chinese industrial facilities and uh, raw materials plus we land production and market with the drugs registration for the finished product and uh, the sales market. Uh, this will support the, uh, the whole neighbor countries and uh, for this region uh, in the funds for industrial promotion. And also, uh, I believe we can expansion the market to the uh, region countries like Laos and uh, Cambodia. Okay, that's very interesting. So essentially, you know, as we know, China is a powerhouse manufacturing. Uh, and so within the pharmaceutical space, China has over 10,000 manufacturing factories. And part of that knowledge can definitely be shared with the industries here in Vietnam. So can we talk a little bit about knowledge sharing? And we talked about, uh, Mr. Fu initially talked about the infrastructure and how that's being built out. Let's talk about the knowledge. Right? How can we, how can the two countries share knowledge within the pharmaceutical space to help grow the sectors in both countries? Okay, uh, actually, Super Farm have some uh, working experience in the cooperation with the Vietnam and uh, the Asian countries and uh, the pharmaceutical field. And, uh, because Super Farm is the uh, largest pharmaceutical company uh, in China, and uh, we have the capacity and the, a wide range of the production to meet the market of the different uh, countries and regions. Uh, and secondly, the single farm have the experience and the resources uh, in the international development. Uh, as we have the factories in Malaysia, in Iran, in UAE, and in Latin America. And uh, we have the deeply cooperation with the international uh, partners and uh, we are uh, would like to have the, the next uh, stage in the Vietnam bring more and more Chinese tradition medicine uh, brand uh, and uh, to Vietnam uh, because we have uh, very comprehensive for production system and the uh, single farm we have more than 3,000 uh, uh, pharmaceutical brand in China. We would like to bring our uh, technologies and uh, the finances and uh, the manpower to be not to cooperate with the local companies to get us the more uh, drugs and uh, have the user uh, development. That's very interesting. So essentially China has, or, or Sinopharm, has experience not only in doing uh, Western pharmaceuticals, but also traditional Chinese medicines. Uh, and the company has started expanding manufacturing, not just in China, but also to Indonesia, UAE, and also to Vietnam. And in those relationships, China, or Sinopharm, acts as the knowledge holder and sharing that knowledge with the recipient countries. And then those countries in turn manufacture and then sell domestically, which then grows the market for both countries. 
that that's a very kind of a harmonious way uh, to cooperate between the countries. Uh, so, quick uh, quick summary. So, Mike started by talking about how uh, communication and access are key to developing uh, any type of relationship uh, within within Asia or in general. And then uh, Fu dug a little bit deeper to see, okay, well, there's the Belt and Road Initiative. How is that helping manufacturing and businesses between the two countries? He gave us a great example of how Sino Farm is doing it. So let's uh, move the conversation over to uh, Hansen. Um, so we, in our prior conversation, we talked about how the knowledge sharing is really important. Right? We both agree sharing knowledge between the two countries is key. Uh, are you noticing something that is happening in China that's important to share so that we can all learn together? Uh, I think you talked about the middle income trap, and uh, why do you think China is heading into this country, into this trap? Let's uh, see if uh, members of the audience have heard of this concept, uh, the middle income trap. Uh, does anybody know anything about it? MIT, middle income trap. Only very few of you know. And congratulations if you know. A little prize for you at the end of this presentation. Uh, but uh, you know, normally when we think about MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where my uncle graduated from as a uh, aerospace engineer. But in economics, MIT is something much more uh, serious. It's the problem of how emerging economies can grow very fast for a period of time and then enter into some sort of stagnation. It's not economic collapse. It's not a recession. It's just a stagnation, meaning a period of prolonged, slow growth where per capita income no longer increases and the emerging economy fails to catch up with the, the, the club of rich countries in the world. Um, some good examples of South, uh, Southeast Asia would be uh, countries like Malaysia. Malaysia was approaching uh, uh, breakthrough to a rich country in about the year 1996. And after the Asian financial crisis of 1997, for the past 25 years, it's stagnated. But that's not the only country. Thailand, our neighbor here from here, is also stuck in this middle income trap. There are a number of countries that have done even more poorly, like Argentina was uh, 100 years ago tipped to become a rich country. And now it is a country that every decade or so gets into a foreign debt crisis. There are many reasons why emerging economies grow very fast for a time and then slow down. Some of the more common causes postulated by economists and uh, political theorists say that it's something about the gap between rich and poor in a country or the failure of the government to invest in uh, public infrastructure, or perhaps uh, a failure of government to, to provide adequate education and training for the workforce, or perhaps a, a lot of uh, official corruption, that could be another problem. Uh, and uh, the list goes on and on. But what's interesting about the case of China is that uh, ever since President Xi Jinping came to power about uh, 11 years ago now, that China has actually done what most economists would say, you know, the right measures to try to solve these problems and encounter these factors that could cause an economy to slow down. For instance, President Xi Jinping launched a, an official anti-corruption drive and is continuing that drive. Uh, to, to catch uh, corrupt officials high and low. China's also spending all money on technical education and uh, there's a lot of public subsidy for research and development. China has first class uh, public infrastructure in terms of airport, high speed rail, freeways and highways, uh, uh, subway systems, you name it. Yeah, most of uh, of the Chinese public infrastructure projects in the past 25, 30 years is world class. Uh, so that cannot be the problem. And yet, despite all these measures, China is noticeably slowing down. Some, some people thought maybe just the COVID pandemic, but China has now opened up uh, since the end of the pandemic for more than a year now, about a year and a half. 
The slowdown continues. IMF has a branch in Beijing that recently reforecast the uh, prospective growth rate of the Chinese economy and cut um, future growth rates by more than 1% per annum. And so now, uh, China is forecast to uh, have growth rates that slow down to about 3.5%, 3% per annum by the end of the decade. That would be not much better than many uh, North American and European rich countries. And at that rate, China will never catch up to America. So the question is why? So this is important because a country like Vietnam can learn from China. There are many similarities that the Vietnamese uh, people and government share with that of China. Vietnam is a country that is governed by one single party. It's a socialist party. Uh, and um, there is uh, no competitive politics, or very little. Uh, secondly, uh, both countries have a hybrid economy of both state-owned state -owned enterprises and private sector. And how, how is capital allocated between these sectors is a, a very good question and a big challenge. So if we could learn from the Chinese example, perhaps other emerging economies can take some lessons and see if problems can be resolved to ensure continued progress. Also, China itself is a big engine for global economic growth uh, because China buy, not just sell a lot and export a lot, China often buys a lot uh, from other countries too. So as long as China grows fast, it's an engine to pull other emerging economies uh, up, uh, up by the boot bootstraps. So the question is why? And I can give you a few observations of mine that I think uh, is, uh, could be of interest to all of us. Some of it peculiar to China, but some of it applicable to many other countries. Um, for instance, what we have right now is uh, a process of globalization that is stalling. And why is that happening? Mostly because there is a strategic rivalry that's intensifying between America and China. Obviously, this is geopolitics, but economics is every bit as affected by geopolitics as economic policy. America now sees China as a serious rival, as a power, as a superpower that may build uh, new international institutions that would rival the sort of liberal democratic institutions that America has built uh, at the end of the Second World War. Things like the IMF, the World Bank, uh, Asia Development Bank, uh, IMF and so on, these are all institutions that were built uh, at the end of the Second World War under American leadership. But of course, uh, President Xi Jinping of China is trying to build an alternative set of international develop developmental organizations, such as the Belt and Road Initiative, such as uh, the Shanghai Dialogue Group, uh, and such as the BRICS Bank which comprises Brazil, Russia, uh, India, uh, China, and South Africa. A as well as, um, the, you know, China's also doing its own infrastructure and development finance, independent of uh, the Asian Development Bank and the World Bank. So America sees that as being a challenge to, to uh, the institutions that have been founded 70 years ago at the end of the Second World War. Also, uh, President Xi Jinping perceives a much more assertive foreign policy in terms of projecting Chinese economic power and influence uh, on neighboring countries and countries to, on, with which China trades a lot with. So these are things that have led to America's concerns. America now tries to do what is called selective decoupling where certain key industries and supply chains they want to take away from China, and also sanctions on certain Chinese entities uh, and, and restrict access of, of China to uh, cutting edge research, especially in things like chip design and chip making and so on. So this is one, one factor that's unique uh, to uh, the Chinese situation. 
But there are other factors, such as the over-reliance on, uh, on public infrastructure investment as an engine to, to push economic growth. Uh, Chinese public uh, infrastructure is already world's first class, and if there's much more money being poured into it, what happens is you get what is called a declining return on investment. And a good example is Malaysia. My Malaysian friends always joke, how many of you are from Malaysia? Wave, raise your hands. Any, anyone at all? No? My Malaysian friends always joke about how Malaysia has first class infrastructure and third class mentality in terms of management. So that's the difference between hardware and software. Yes, I'm sorry, we have to, uh I have to cut in a little bit, just in, in the interest of time. Uh, this is super fascinating. Uh, this is definitely a, a topic that I thought a lot about, and how does Vietnam avoid this trap, especially as we look at, at our neighbors, so you mentioned Thailand, potentially Philippines also. Uh, how do you see us trying to prevent this from happening? You talk a lot about the why, and the why is important. Uh, any thoughts on, on how we can uh, you know, stop, stop this from going down this path? I think first of all, it takes two to tangle. So you know, if America wants to view China as a rival, then it makes it difficult for China to try to improve that relationship. I think China is trying, but uh, you know, uh, I think there are some things that China can do to sort of reduce regional tensions. China has a lot of border disputes and border claims uh, uh, against uh, Japan, for instance, uh, India, in the South China Sea, and so on. And I always use the European North Sea example as a way for, for countries that share a common sea to talk not about borders, because nobody can live on the sea unless you're fishermen, and there are not, not many of them anymore. But how to share underwater natural resources, like underwater mineral, oil, and gas resources, and how to share fishing rights. And I think European countries have set a very good example on the North Sea Accords uh, that were slowly built up in the 1950s. And I think China needs to face up to that. Now, having a large PLA Navy does not mean that you can, you know, enforce territorial claims that uh, that are not recognized by your neighbors. That just causes smaller Southeast Asian countries to. Uh, get into a stronger alliance with America, which is to China's detriment. Secondly, China needs to build up its uh, sort of social welfare system. My Chinese friends always say that China's taxation rates are no lower than in the rich countries, but yet in terms of free services, public services, social welfare, China ranks a lot lower. So you see a lot of illegal the migrants go to America, go to Europe, but they never walk across the border to China because there are no freebies in China. So what happens there is it's true that you get a bunch of very hardworking citizens, but then they also then do not consume too much. Chinese consumption as a percentage of GDP is only about 37%, versus rich countries, well over 50% of GDP is pushed by private consumption. And also, private consumption helps to develop the services industry. So as China transitions from just a, 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 an industrialized country to a more sophisticated, developed economy, it's not just about uh, moving uh, up the value chain to high tech, to chip making, to making commercial aircraft and aerospace. It's also about encouraging um, fine arts, encouraging professional services and personal services. And so that can only happen if Chinese consumers have confidence to, to, to spend more money and save less. And, and that in turn requires the state to spend more money on social security, social welfare, free education, free medical, medical care, uh, and some uh, public pension funds and so on. Also, China needs to address a very big problem, which is the demographics of the population. China is notorious uh, in having the, the, a very big imbalance in terms of parental responsibility. I think that, okay, let's uh, stop there. Thank you, Anson. Okay. So, so essentially, uh, the, the message here is uh, China could potentially be heading toward the middle income trap, something that Vietnam could also, considering the similarities between the two economies. 
and uh, Anson talked about potential reasons how we can avoid this. And looking from the top down, looking at policies and relationships with other countries, policies for the citizens within the country. Uh, now, I would like to uh, enter a closet which is coming from the bottom up. Uh, so I spent the past 15 years in venture capital, and one of the themes that is generally always talked about in venture capital is technology, and how can technology and innovation grow an economy uh, and continue to push forward the people in that country. Uh, and we have a panelist on, uh, on our panel today that's an expert in that, Ms. Pong. Uh, and Pong and I talked about how um, China is uh, very aware that technology and innovation is very important. Uh, so I'd like to uh, break up the conversation with Ms. Pong into two different areas. One is within China, and then after that, we'll talk about how China is helping technology outside of China. Let, let's start with within China. Can you talk to us a little bit about what China is doing to help grow the technology and innovation within, uh, within China? Okay, look at this question. Um, I like to use examples to go to the uh, Chinese version of Silicon Valley. So, for Zhu Guanzhou, I'll give you a very brief feeling of uh, numbers about Zhu Guanzhou. Zhu uh, Guanzhou is about nearly 500 square kilometers, and there are over 16,000 national uh, certified high tech companies. And the companies with the, uh, the revenue over 100 million is about, uh, there are about more than 4,000 companies with revenue over 100 million. So that's a few numbers about the for the for the sectors. Do want to cover the information technologies, including semiconductor, and the healthcare. We have we say smart manufacturing, and the, in the morning session, I think uh, the, uh, we have a session that's put down the proposal the government and making a similar thing. So I think we will have some some similar kind of uh, industry insights. So, um, the one to me is a kind of Chinese version of our innovation. And in the, in the last uh, 40 years, they always promote the, uh, we say, support innovation. So in summer, in summer, uh, the one to last year, they, they just launched uh, initiatives called, uh, to build world-class science park. So it's called, it's a kind of way say one plus five pack. The one is that I mentioned is a uh, total kind of uh, total initiatives. And they follow follow that they launch five actions, five actions actually uh, policies make things really, really happen. Uh, they kind of locate over one billion RMB. All Let me say one by one about these five, uh, five area, five policies. The first one is trying to improve innovation capabilities. It's more about to provide capital to support R and D things in, in the company. The second one is about to promote the wisdom. Uh, technology finance actually is trying to promote the finance support to the, the high-tech high -tech company, the startups, including startups and uh, the world company, big company as well. That's the second one. The third one is more focused on the science park. We say it's about the kind of a platform, including incubators, including university science parks, that's where the technology comes from, where the technology is born and there. Uh, the fourth is very much about the trying to uh, support, we say, calling the ecosystem. Uh, the ecosystem kind of cover everything, but the one to now is more uh, focused on, for example, IP, intellectual properties. Uh, it's not not just provide capital, but also kind of a launch. We say kind of a, a fast track 
for the technology company, they can apply the, uh, the, the patents more quickly and more easily. And the fifth is just a base management about differently about the organization things uh, in terms of trying to support uh, on the, we say, inbound, outbound, inbound, trying to uh, invite maybe uh, Western, uh, not Western, but global, uh, the R&D, uh, the, the operating office, and also entrepreneurs to, to have a presence in Zhonghua too. And the other side is outbound. Same thing, so try to help or promote the Chinese companies that have R&D or some other offices uh, global. We always help them to to apply, you know, apply the, the patents. So, in the South, that's the five percent. That's, uh, I think that's very interesting. I think a lot of uh, countries are adopting something similar. Um, and, and I think um, a lot of people think that this could be similar to the Silicon Valley approach, right? So you, you start with the big corporates, uh, those those teach the technology industry, the people who are high performing there, they quit the large corporates, they start their own startups, they graduate from universities, they join the incubators, and so you build the whole ecosystem. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how China is bringing that outside of China? Okay, um, that's used by my work, uh, when I share my background with you, um, I would say from two levels. One is about the, we say, our global incubator networks. We already set up our first incubator in Tsinghua. So uh, later, that uh, incubator global, uh, very much uh, along with our luminaries. So we have incubator in the UK, we have incubator in other European countries, we also have incubator for kind of uh, Say innovation camp uh, Indonesia. Also, we have a presence in Malaysia as well. And but that's about kind of what we say. Uh, on the other side, we have the venture funds. We have venture funds in Silicon Valley. Uh, it's a kind of our first uh, fund outside outside China. Uh, also, we have venture funds in, in Europe as well. Um, to some. The, the support from the government, uh, I could summarize from a few levels. First is about the capital to the fund. So we definitely got capital uh, from outside China and also from China as well. Sometimes we have a 50 50 things, so to have that. So the needs to be the fund size. I also got the support. On the operation level. The operation level means we got more broad support on the uh, R&D, if we do R&D uh, outside China, and then we can get it up to from the industry of the Chinese science, science and technology. And also, at that time, I think it's uh, not a few, like maybe 10 years ago, that we got similar support from UK government as well. So it's a kind of balance. Uh, the other different way is about the provider, provide kind of a physical space that are regularly happening. But for Malay things, it could be interesting because uh, Malay, Malay had a very close uh, sort of a friendship uh, with Guangxi uh, province. So at a, at a time, we set up a kind of a uh, China Malay Science Park in, in Guangxi. Uh, along with that, we set up an equity fund in that to invest into the companies in both countries. Uh, we invest into the, the company in Malay, Malay companies who have a kind of a, a business opportunity in China and as well as that, yeah. So we started uh, our Southeast Asia presence a few years ago in Malay, in Singapore, in Indonesia, and I definitely we are willing to see more in Vietnam as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Han. So let me quickly summarize before we move on to our last uh, speaker. 
So we started with uh, Mike, who talked about the importance of accessing communication. Uh, and then we moved uh, from there to talk about the Belt Road and the Two Quarters of Wendell Initiatives. And uh, who explained to us how uh, the uh, Seagull Farm example, how they are doing that, using these initiatives to continue to grow the manufacturing uh, within Southeast Asia. And then Anson talks a little bit about some of the upcoming potential problems, uh, namely the middle income trap, and how can we continue uh, to share knowledge between the countries so that we can avoid these traps together. And then Ms. Peng uh, talks about the, uh, the innovation and the technology support that China is providing within China and also outside of China. So as you can see, our first four speakers are very knowledgeable about the Chinese market. So let's move on to our last speaker, Ms. Kwan, who definitely, last but not least, uh, we're going to go a little bit more detail, but as promised earlier, we talked broad about policies and programs, and now let's get more specific. Uh, I know that we're all here in Vietnam, and uh, many of you are running companies here or are considering uh, entering the market. And so I talked to uh, Ms. Kwan about providing some really kind of concrete advice on how to operate in Vietnam. And so we will talk in three different categories with this one. Uh, we will talk first about regulatory issues. Uh, then we'll talk about employees, but as we all know, employee issues are one of the top problems that all management faces. Uh, and then the last one will be consumer. Uh, if you're operating here, how do you uh, sell effectively to the customer in Vietnam? Uh, so let's head over to Ms. Kwan. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, some of the, the regulations that a business needs to be aware of uh, when they are operating in Vietnam? A foreign business. A foreign business. Hello? Hello? Uh, I think the corporate tax in Vietnam uh, is quite uh, good. Uh, it's uh, now it's a uh, 20%. Uh, actually, it is uh, lower than the corporate tax of China by 5%. Uh, and compare with other neighbor countries like uh, Philippines, Mongolia, or Bangladesh, actually our corporate tax is very attractive to foreign investment. So I think uh, in the future, that may have a lot of the foreigner will interest to uh, across to Vietnam to to, have, to find their jobs. Uh, but uh, before I uh, answer uh, your question, may I have a uh, uh, I want to ask a. Uh, have there any officer of the Department of Labor sitting here? <laughs> I want to tell a true story. Before we talk about them. <laughs> I, want to, I want to tell a true story. Actually, the foreigner here, uh, when we want to come to Vietnam, the first thing, they have to get the entry visa. And if they want to stay here to find a job, uh, they have to follow with the work permit. Work permit. But work permit, uh, Everything we have to come back with the Department of Labor. Uh, what I want to say is the formalities to for the application is very very complicated. Very complicated. Uh, I would like to raise a case of my niece. Uh, after graduating the university from uh, Taiwan, and he came to join our new Toyo Group, and actually he has to spend two tickets to return to the country uh, to complete all the personal uh, certifi certification. Uh, uh, I think the, the regulation here is uh, quite uh, strictly, uh, it seems uh, more uh, welcome to the expert investor or some very uh, special uh, skilled uh, worker. Uh, for those uh, graduate uh, students, it's not, it seems not, not much welcome to be find a job here. So I think, uh, and the other thing is, uh, all the application must go through the Department of the Labor. Since uh, we have so many industrial in in uh, in the Vietnam and in especially in Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, should government consider to empowering to the industrial zone to let them to handle the case of the foreigner uh, application, uh, whatever the visa, apply the visa, uh, working permit, or extend the, the 
permit. That should be uh, it's good for the foreigners. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is a very kind of tricky, um, funny, but yet also frustrating topic. Uh, there are a lot of things that Ms. Kwan talked about uh, that uh, I think as you enter the Vietnam market, you, you'll kind of face it and realize that it's not so funny anymore now that you're stuck. Uh, for example, uh, when I first came to Vietnam, uh, I had to provide my diploma. I also got my MBA from abroad. And they needed to make sure that your degree is the same as what you're working in. But nowadays, most of the time, most people aren't doing what they study. Right? So, so it, it's little little loopholes, not loopholes, but little um, fine print items like this that make it actually very difficult for you to operate and bring in your senior management team. Uh, so definitely something that uh, all uh, business owners should consider and be very aware of, that it will take much longer than you actually think uh, to get up and running. Uh, so now that, let's say, now you're kind of progressing through and you set up and you're running, now you have people, now you have employees, which then run into employee problems. Ms. Kwan, can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, I think uh, I have uh, more than 30 years as the CEO of the new Toyo aluminum packaging company here. Uh, we, we have to care about the people. Uh, we, ha uh, we have to build a, a good environment for them to be safe, to cooperate with us in the long term. Uh, the employee here is a, how we are saying, uh, in Vietnamese. They respect uh, the emotion and the bonds between employee and employer. Uh, yeah. So uh, I would like to really explain how uh, the COVID pandemic here all the enterprise, the manufacturer must uh, call to be on site. So I, I recall that the number of check-in for my employee is uh, more than 90%. In case we don't have a good relationship with the employees, at that moment, all the people will run away from the factory. All the people are scared of that. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, we, we should uh, care about our employees, uh, heart by heart. Yeah, so they will feel like that, and uh, in case uh, our company or factory, we, we are facing the emergency situation, and they will uh, stand by side with us, yeah, not run away. Yeah, I think that's a very important concept. Uh, I think that uh, I spent for a few years in the U.S., and the U.S. is all about unions, right? And when you talk about unions, it's all about uh, benefits to the employee and the negotiations and the contracts. Right, so very, very formal and rigid. Uh, and then you hear about um, factories in other countries where it's all about the bottom line, right? reduce costs as much as possible so you can get a product as cheap as possible. Uh, but in Vietnam, the other thing you have to consider is actually the feelings of the employees. And this sounds very foreign as a business person. <laughs> you kind of almost don't care about emotions, right? But it's actually very important uh, in Vietnam. Uh, I think uh, one statistic, or one fun fact, that it's not an official statistic, but most factory owners that I speak to, after the Lunar New Year, about half your employees will not come back. That's just a, the standard of operating in Vietnam. You would lose half your workforce. You have a factory of 1,000 employees, you now have to rehire 500 employees every year. Right, so uh, what Ms. Kwan is saying is actually very important. You need to develop that employer-employee relationship so that the employees will continue their, uh, I don't want to say loyalty, but it's more of like the, the emotional bond they have with the employer, and that's how you can continue to build and grow more quickly. The engagement. Yeah. And, and then our, our last topic would be uh, the customer. And so how, how can foreign companies think about engaging the Vietnamese customer? The consumer. Right, so uh, the last topic, so we went from regulatory to employees. The last one is the customer. Right, so how can, when a foreign company enters Vietnam, they have to think about how do they need to structure their product so that it appeals to the Vietnamese consumer? You talk about the customs. Customers customer. here, uh, B2C or B2B? Uh, B2C. B2C. Actually, my business is B2B, 
So how can I answer your question? Well, we talked about earlier about the quality uh, okay, and the yeah. price. Uh, I, I just uh, I recall the message I just read in the uh, internet. Uh, according to the uh, report from the Insider of Intelligence, uh, in the Vietnam market, uh, there are 63.8 million persons are using the smartphone. Uh, the, the, the calculation is 1.6% higher than last year. That means all the consumer here is a very uh, care about the, the high tech and they are willing to pay whatever 1,000 or 2,000 per one smartphone and they, they, they are willing to get a new one. Then, yeah. So I think the quality is uh, uh, very important because the uh, iPhone uh, is, um, I think it's the most good uh, smartphone that uh, more welcome in the world, right? Uh, so uh, quality is an issue and the other thing is the service. The service services must come, uh, must uh, follow uh, after the, the sales uh, transaction. Uh, uh, I, I would like to talk about a little bit about the uh, uh, B2B. Uh, like how we how we get our customer as a foreigner company, how we get the support from the local uh, customers. Uh, we we have of, of course we have to strengthen uh, standardize our quality, and then we have to set our uh, self service uh, policies. It depends on the uh, level of the customers, uh, and then uh, we have to uh, some. Uh, Special, uh, how would I say? Uh, we, we have to some uh, special uh, uh, yearly program uh, to uh, the activities uh, to, to, to serve to our uh, the customers. Uh, and, and then, and I think the uh, local market is a uh, very very concerned about the quality and the sales service at the same time. Thank you. Uh, I think. The, the key message here is just because you're selling to the Vietnamese market does not mean you should sell, your strategy should be the low price leader. Right? Because there are many people in Vietnam that are buying the iPhone full price. Uh, they are looking for high tech, they are looking for high customer service. Right? So that's something to consider when you start thinking about your business in Vietnam. Okay, so I think that's the, uh, our last speaker. Uh, I think we may have time for maybe one question. Does anybody in the office, I mean, in the audience has a, a burning question for any of our uh, panelists? We can uh, take a question. Yeah. Any factories uh, looking to enter Vietnam? Okay, well, I think that the, uh, the panelists will also be around later if you want to talk to them during the, the break. Uh, so I'm going to wrap up here. I think the, the key theme that we look at here is there's a lot of knowledge in China and there's a lot of potential in Vietnam. And the two countries are very active in working with each other. And I think the common theme I'm seeing is that we're both very open. Very open to sharing and working together. And I think across all the panelists, when I spoke to them separately, everybody said, look, we're all in Asia, let's work together and let's bring to the world a high quality Asian product. And I think that's a, a really great way to look about it. It's a great way to uh, really go into this conference uh, thinking about how you can meet other people here and how we can all cooperate together. Uh, there, this is not a, a competition. I think this is a, a more of how can we work together to grow together. And I'm very excited to hear the, the panels for the rest of today and tomorrow. Uh, thank you very much for being here today.